All right, so this is the last video of the day, and in this last section, we're going to start off by talking about application of Dalton's law of partial pressure and the idea of collecting gas over water. So if you look in your notes, it says one of the skills you'll be expected to know is based upon finding the moles of gas collected during a chemical reaction. You'll be using this particular skill in an upcoming experiment, which would be prepping for the molar volume of a gas lab, which we're going to start tomorrow. So we're going to look at this following chemical reaction, which is magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid to produce magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. So when we do this, the object basically is to collect the amount of hydrogen gas produced right here. The gas is collected using a bottle that's initially filled with water and inverted in a pan. During the course of the reaction, hydrogen gas is bubbled into the bottle displacing the water. And we're going to be using something known as a udiometer to collect our hydrogen gas and measure it. The total pressure inside the bottle is composed of two parts, which we see right here. The first part is the pressure of the gas collected, while the other part is the pressure of the water vapor in equilibrium with the liquid water inside the udiometer. To find the pressure of only the collected gas, the pressure of the water vapor, which we denote right here, must be subtracted out. The problem is that the gas collected will be saturated with water vapor caused by the evaporation of water at room temperature. Removing the water is done by noting the temperature of the water, which we're going to see down here, and referring to Appendix 2. So say that the total pressure of the gas inside the humidity is 765 torr and the water vapor is at 26 degrees Celsius. What you would do is go to your textbook and you'd go to Appendix 2, Section E on page A14 and you look up the water vapor at 26 degrees Celsius. And for the sake of time right now, I'm going to tell you that if we look that up, our pressure will be 25.21 torr. And we're going to use that in our next example. Then we're going to use the ideal gas equation to solve for the number of moles of hydrogen gas if it's given that two liters of gas is collected. So what we're going to do is we're going to take P total, pressure total, which is equal to pressure of our gas plus the pressure of the water vapor. So the first thing that we want to do is get basically the pressure of our gas. So in this problem, it said that 765 torr is our total pressure. We're going to solve for the pressure of the gas. And I told you that the pressure of the water vapor at 26 degrees Celsius is 25.21 torr. So what we're going to do is subtract 25.21 torr from 756 torr, and that will give us the individual or the partial pressure of our gas, which is 739.79 torr. Okay, so we have now the pressure of our gas. What we need to do is we need to solve for number of moles, and moles tells us ideal gas law. So PV equals NRT. The pressure of the gas is what we just solved for over here. So that's going to be 739.79. The volume is 2 liters. Right here, we're solving for number of moles. And then we have our gas constant, which again, we're dealing with torr, which is 62.36 torr. And then finally, we take our 26 degrees Celsius and we convert that into Kelvin, and that is 299. So if we do that, we will solve for the number of moles of hydrogen gas, and that is 0 0.079 moles of hydrogen. And that is one of the things that we are going to do tomorrow as part of beginning to get ready for the experiment that we're going to do on Monday, the idea of collecting gas over water. Now let's talk about kinetic molecular theory, or KMT for short. And this is just the general properties of an ideal gas. Uh, so the first one is that gases are in constant random motion, which means they're always in motion, not really predictable, but they're always random in their movement. 
The second one is that the total volume of a gas is negligible compared to the total volume of the container. So basically saying that gases really don't have volume. The attractive and repulsive forces of gases are also negligible. So when we think about later on down the line, things like Van der Waals forces or dipole-dipole forces, really in gases, in an ideal gas, they really don't apply. All collisions are elastic. And finally, the average kinetic energy is proportional to the absolute temperature. In other words, larger molecules have slower speeds, and we're going to see that in a moment. So now let's talk about the distribution of molecular speeds. According to the kinetic molecular theory, particles of a different masses, different masses, have the same average kinetic energy at a given temperature. The kinetic energy of a particle depends on its mass and velocity according to the equation kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity squared. The only way for particles of different masses to have the same kinetic energy is for them to have different velocities. So in a gas mixture at a given temperature, lighter particles travel faster on average than heavier ones, which makes sort of sense if you think about them. They're all going to be at the same temperature because they have the same kinetic energy, but lighter particles are going to move faster, while heavier particles are going to move slower. One way that we can look at these different velocities is looking at this uh, diagram right here, which gives variation of velocity distributions with molar mass. So these curves represent average velocity of particles, where the peak in each curve represents the average velocity of that particular particle. There are particles which are moving faster and some that are moving slower than average. So if we look at this, we can say, all right, here's diatomic oxygen, which if we work that out, they'll have an average atomic mass of 32, and nitrogen is 28, and water is 18, helium is going to be 4, and hydrogen is going to be 2. So our oxygen molecules are obviously going to be moving slower. So if we look down at molecular velocity, they are down towards the lower end, while our particles that are lighter will be distributed across and at the peak. So look, if we look at hydrogen, the peak is right here. They're on average going to have a much higher velocity. So for lighter particles, such as helium and hydrogen, the velocity distribution is shifted towards higher velocities more towards a peak of here and more of a peak towards here, which are obviously higher velocities. And the curve becomes broader, indicating a wider range of velocities. So that means, on average, even though they have higher velocities, some velocities of hydrogen molecules are even higher and some are lower. Same thing with the helium. The average velocity would be around here, but some of those particles have a higher velocity or a lower depending on individual particles. For heavier particles, such as oxygen and nitrogen, the velocity distribution is located around lower velocities, and the curve is higher, indicating a smaller range of velocities. So my curve is higher because my range is smaller, and because they're heavier, they're found more commonly around the lower velocities. So this is the average velocity of an oxygen. That would be its peak right here. Here would be the average velocity of nitrogen. So because they're heavier, they're going to have a smaller range of velocities. The last thing that we want to look at is just how velocity distribution is going to change with temperature. So as temperature increases, the velocity increases, and the distribution becomes broader, broader. As temperature decreases, the velocity of the particles will decrease and the distribution becomes narrower. So this space underneath these curves is all representing the same amount of area of space, but this is at a much lower temperature than as we go to higher temperature and temperatures and even higher temperatures after that. My distribution of velocities is going to increase a lot and become much broader. As the temperature gets lower, the distribution becomes much narrower. So it's important to be able to look at these different diagrams and say, well, this is a diagram of a gas at a lower temperature versus 
This is a diagram of a gas at a higher temperature just due to average velocities and how broad they are. Finally, we just want to look at two factors that depart from the ideal gas behavior. So two factors contribute to the deviation from ideal gas behavior. One is the fact that real gases most definitely will have molecule-molecule forces of attraction. So gas molecules are attracted to one another at short distances. When we start revisiting the concepts like intermolecular forces and talk about van der Waals forces and dipole-dipole forces, uh, we'll see that actually play out. And then the other thing is that the gases do have a finite volume. So the finite volume of gas particles or the gas particle size becomes important at high pressure because the volume of the particles themselves will occupy a significant portion of the total volume of a gas. So this is basically saying that gases do have volume, unlike the kinetic molecular theory, which basically says that the volume of a gas is negligible. Last but not least, let's talk about effusion and diffusion and just how they are different. Effusion is the process by which a gas escapes from one vessel to another by passing through a very small opening. So you can think of almost like a pinprick in a balloon and gases moving out from inside the balloon to outside of the balloon. That's known as effusion. Defusion, on the other hand, is the process by which a homogeneous mixture is formed by the random mixing of two different gases. How you can really visualize this is the idea of somebody spraying perfume in a room. It's very concentrated in terms of particles close to where the perfume was sprayed, but as it diffuses out across the room, it gets much, much less dense and the two gases the vapors from the perfume and the vapors and the gases in the air basically combine together making one homogeneous mixture altogether. And that, ladies and gentlemen, ends the third video and all the notes that you need to know for the rest of the gases unit. Thanks for hanging in there with me and I hope uh, you have a great day.